Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Wagner. After going through my resume, it sounds like I have some kind of attention deficit disorder and I couldn't quite figure out what I wanted to do. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'd like to especially thank uh, Mr. Berberick for finding some little niche for me so I could fill part of the regulators panel. And I'm still wondering, <laughs> no, 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 I'm recovering. But I, I do have to ask you, um, Steve, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the idea of a derb tattoo. So when you're ready to go for that tattoo, I'll buy your, your first drinks before and after. <laughs> Can't wait to see how that I'll turns out. I'll let you pick the site. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let that one go. So turning to uh, my former regulator colleagues, um, I'm not sure if you all were here this morning, but um, there was an, an attempt to what would you um, name a group of regulators, whether it was a gaggle, a gang, and of course um, everybody flocked to the, the concept of a murder of regulators. So <laughs> with that theme, <laughs> um, I'm just teasing you. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for all of you. I've gotten to know many of you for many years now, and more recently, Bob Weisenmiller and I have served on a committee together, and it's, it's been a, a great run. We have a great set of commissioners in the West. Unlike um, many of the other parts of the, the country, um, I hear constantly the, the collaboration among Western commissioners is unprecedented and um, admired. But leading into our, co our conversation today about regional collaboration, what does that exactly mean? Um, it has to be more than talk. It requires action. And I think the energy imbalance market um, is a good example of taking that talk and make, taking it into action. It started, the seeds were planted um, through some NGOs, the Western Grid Group, speaking to groups of commissioner, or a group of commissioners at um, CREPSI. I always b butchered the, the acronym, so I'm not gonna even try. Um, and we started talking about it, which evolved into the PUC EIM group, which led to the ISO saying, hey, we might be able to do something about this to now we have almost one full year of participation by, um, by Pacific Corps. Um, the utility in my home state, Nevada, is hopefully will start on November 1st. Fingers crossed, FERC. Um, and with more and more utilities signing implementation agreements and ex exploring opportunities. So the landscape of the West has is, is never been so ripe for opportunity. Um, there's, there's changes that are um, the potential for change is amazing to the benefit of each of our states. It's not just about California, it's about what we all can do together and the benefits we can derive by working together. Um, I think it was Governor Brown, I heard him use the quote, uh, um, rising tide floats all boats. It's economic interests in states like mine with vast renewables and it's about our consumers ultimately. How, how can they benefit and what we need to get past is our preconceived notions, both from inside California looking out and outside California looking in. And I think that there's tremendous opportunity. I look to all of you. I'm anxious to hear your comments. Um, how are you going to rise to this challenge? Are you going to stand back and, and be skeptical and, and let the wave ride by? Or are you going to stand up, do what's best for your consumers, um, whatever um, uh, climate change um, goals that you have or you don't have. I mean, there's, there's boundless opportunities um, in all aspects of our new energy landscape. And we're here now um, on the cusp of something big. Um, and so I'll, I'll conclude with a quote from Ben Franklin. And I'm not one for quoting, but I, I really like this one. And he said, I think it was prior to um, signing the um, Declaration of Independence that we must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly, we shall all hang together. So with that, <laughs> I shouldn't say get a rope, no. <laughs> I will turn it over to Mr. Danner to, uh, to take you through your torture, and I hope all of you don't drink too much water while you're up here, because it's a long haul. <laughs> So
so I'm, I'm, I'm taking Rebecca's challenge up. Uh, I had a chance during lunch to check out the right nomenclature for a group, right? And I went through all the usuals, you know, exaltation of larks. But I thought some other ones were, were kind of candidates here. A skulk of foxes, a smack of jellyfish, a parliament of owls, an ostentation of peacocks. So I, that kind of got me going. And, and uh, you know, I appreciate it because Steve actually you know, put out one candidate here. It's a round table of regulators. But that was kind of blah, I thought, right? So my best candidate right now is a rodeo of regulators. <laughs> because, you know, in a rodeo, you have, you have folks that sometimes, you know, are unpredictable and, and sometimes have independent spirits and independent reasons for doing what they're doing. Um, but occasionally they can be corralled. Occasionally uh, they, can, they can kind of point in the right direction. But just to mix my metaphors a little bit, um, I just want you guys to know, because we have eight distinguished regulators here, but I'm going to assert the privilege of the monitor, moderator here, because if we really get, things really get tough, uh, I'll have to flag them. So, first of all, let's, let's welcome the eight of our distinguished commissioners and regulators. Phil Jones from Washington, John Savage from Oregon, Mary Nichols, Steve Berberick, Bob Weisenmiller, and Michael Picker from California, Susan Bitter-Smith from Arizona, and Travis Kabula from Montana. Let me start with the most basic question of all about this issue of regionalization. Are you guys together on this? Do you have a clear notion that you've all kind of signed up for about what regionalization means and where it should go? How about if we start with uh, Mr. Weisenmiller? Thanks, thanks, John. I think the, the basic question for all of us is that there has been a long history throughout the West, going back to the late 60s, early 70s, for regional uh, arrangements, which have, we've done inter you know, massive inner ties, we've done trading, and we've used the diversity of loads and diversity of resources to really benefit all of us. And it's been a, a real, I remember in the 80s when, when BPA spent a lot of time on the Westwide vision. You know, the notion that again, together we're much better off than individually. Now having said that, looking, going forward, so looking at the past, we have a long tradition. But going forward, we have to look to the challenges uh, and the opportunities. Now in terms of the challenges, obviously some of us are very concerned on the issue of climate change and uh, implications of that for what it means for our citizens and for our state. And at the same time, looking at the opportunities now from technology, uh, that, that sort of drives us, regardless of your feelings on climate change, in the direction of some sort of regional arrangement. That we now have enormous opportunities, you know, heard at lunch, in terms of very low cost solar and wind. And those opportunities are intermittent, which means we have to look at how to deal with the intermittency. And the key approaches to deal with intermittency are really shorter and shorter dispatch periods and larger geographical regions to smooth that out. And that means you need a framework such as what the Cal ISO has in place to really move much more to the grid of the 21st century. So really we're looking at an opportunity here which provides enormous economic benefits across the West and at the same time can really utilize the technology changes and of course thinking out of the next 10 or 15 years, what's the additional technology change we're going to see in the areas of computers, in the areas of sensors, in the areas of energy efficiency and renewables. Again, this is a way to really unlock that technological innovation. Do you think you're in agreement with everybody else on this panel? I'm still trying to figure out whether I'm a peacock or an owl. But once we determine that, I, I think the answer is a big maybe. I think all of us uh, up front know that there is a necessity to have these conversations. 
Um, and as Bob indicated, there's some obvious connectivity that will be beneficial to ratepayers. And there's, and there's certainly a history of us working together, not only on energy issues, but on other natural resource issues such as water. But there is still the lingering question about these policy political differences that are indeed um, variable from state to state to state. And I think it's fair to suggest that Arizona's view potentially policy-wise on climate change may be just a tad bit different than California's view. Um, and so figuring out how we can continue to work together, recognizing, understanding, and acknowledging those differences is going to be our, our big challenge. Uh, we've come a long way, particularly Arizona, in the last nine months because a year ago this time, I would not have been at this meeting, in fact wasn't, um, and there was really no indication Arizona was going to be a player regionally in the EIM. We are now. And I think that those kinds of uh, reviews and, and opportunities, because they can benefit our ratepayers, uh, will be there for Arizona. But there is this balancing act that's going to have to happen between all of the Western states to be able to recognize, acknowledge, and deal with the political, philosophical differences that happen from state to state to state. Michael, what's your take on this one? Are you all pulling in the same direction, or are there fundamental differences, do you think, among the states? First, a quick shout out to Ruth Cox, who was until recently the Region 9 Director of the General Services Administration of the federal government. Hundreds of uh, properties in the Western United States, dozens and dozens of Class A office buildings, a real steward of, uh, of uh, the environment, uh, a real loss to the sustainable real estate industry, but she's joining us in the private sector. So my answer to you, whatever your question is, Ruth, is no. Uh, <laughs> I think that with 150 years of unbroken cooperation and comedy around uh, water issues, I can't see why we shouldn't be able to replicate that here. <laughs> it should be we'll a drink to that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I can't even say that I'm, I'm, I'm totally on board with my other five commissioners on everything. So I think it's, it's really kind of a stretch to say we're totally on board. I think we all realize that in this day and age there's common issues and there's some, some common interests, but really different approaches, really different statutory requirements, really different political contexts. So it's, it's up to us to try to weave it together. For, for many of us up here, there is a very common context in the Western uh, 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 Public Services Commissions under the National Association of Regulatory Utilities Commissioners. And I think that we actually do meet and talk there and, and, and explore these issues. And so far, nobody has actually been expelled from the room, which is, does stand in, in far in advance of water policy. Travis, how do you see this issue of convergence of the vision of what Western regionalization might mean here? Well. Maybe, maybe let's back up and take it from almost a more mundane perspective, I think. You, you heard before, earlier this morning, about the dozens of balancing authorities that exist in the, in the Western interconnection for electricity. And what that practically means is that for some of the small balancing authorities, the ones that are in Montana or Idaho or uh, Wyoming, for instance, uh, when you've got a schedule of renewable energy that those BAs are responsible to integrate, let's just say a thousand megawatts predicted to be online uh, on average over a particular hour in Idaho, and the same amount, a thousand megawatts online in Montana, if one of them drops down suddenly to 900 and the other overproduces 1100, um, one gas plant is going to back off in one of those BAs while another gas plant ramps on. Uh, in the other balancing authority. If you either consolidate balancing authorities uh, or if you join them together through a real-time energy market and fully use the infrastructure that you're already paying for, one way or another, regardless of how efficiently or inefficiently it's used, you, you don't have to have any movement of those thermal generations. It's uh, renewables balancing out one another uh, on a sub-hourly time increment. And I don't think in many other industries we would actually tolerate the latent inefficiencies of the grid like we do in the electric industry sector, which sometimes resembles uh, an airline that's unable to clear its standby list. You know, a, a lot of other places in the world have managed to solve this problem. A lot of other places in the United States have managed to solve this problem. Um, and I think it's time for us to solve one, uh, it as well. Obviously, this conversation is shot through with politics, but, <clears throat> 
I guess I'd just give you an example I, I've used in speaking about this before. Imagine if I have a tomato and you have a tomato, and we both agree that it has, you know, the same caloric value, the same vitamin content, the same role in Italian cooking, um, but that you, in addition to agreeing with me on the objective qualities of the tomato and maybe having more than you need and me less than you need, imagine if you also think that there's an inherent value that your tomato or my tomato is organic, whereas I just think the tomato is an ordinary tomato. Uh, that difference in subjective understanding of the tomato will ironically drive trades to have even greater value than they would otherwise. And that's kind of the paradox of the situation we're in now. It's actually because states have different perceptions, different worldviews about the value of energy that this proposition of trading is so valuable to all states. Mary, how do you read this? A, is there as much consensus as you think there ought to be, or is it even necessary in order to have a greater degree of regional collaboration, if not integration? I, I think we can all look at uh, regional cooperation from different perspectives and have different motivations, uh, and uh, perhaps even uh, a different uh, degree of commitment to the process and still make regional collaboration work. The Clean Air Act is a powerful tool. Uh, we wouldn't be having the kinds of conversations that we're having now if it weren't for the fact that there is a clean power plan that most of us think is likely to survive uh, court challenges and to uh, be governing all of us. And that means that every one of our states, uh, through its governor, each of whom is a separately elected CEO, none of whom wants to yield authority to anybody else, is going to have to file a plan. And what EPA has done in uh, creating this rule is to do it in a way that I think is a very clever in that it allows states to do whatever they want by way of a plan, but it offers some incentives for uh, working together. And I think as states look at those incentives as a practical matter and for the benefit of their own citizens, uh, they uh, are likely to decide that they want to find a way to work together uh, as partners in a trading system of some kind to be designed and determined uh, in order to protect everybody's best interests when it comes to rates, quality, organicness of our, of, of our uh, electricity systems. Phil, how's the, uh, this question look to you from the northernmost perspective on the panel? I would... Um probably be more in the maybe camp of Susan than with Bob and Michael, but I would differentiate. We need to break this down into historical perspectives and the EIM and then the full day ahead market. So it is different than 2000, I would argue, when California passed its statutes. You all remember that in California statutes that passed enabling the ISO, there are specific provisions on a regional wide RTO, but it never happened. So there's a difference, and why, and I don't want to get into the reasons why that did not happen. Uh, I think many of us in the room understand the context. So there is the statutory basis for regional cooperation, but there hasn't been the will to do it. And I think Bob talked about Bonneville's Westwide vision way back in the 70s. Heck, we've been, we've been trading between Bonneville and the Southwest. We have two AC lines, we have a DC line, we have seasonal ex exchanges. British Columbia is part of this. So there's a long history of regional trading in cooperation to the benefit of ratepayers. But California has always been a little bit different. It's the, it's the eighth largest economy in the world. It's huge. And they make policies in a different way than the seven other states do. So what's different today? I think Bob mentioned, and, and, and Mary did too, 111D and climate, very different. Technology is different. Uh, at least the three western states, the coastal states have RPSs. The Rocky Mountain states do not. They're voluntary. So we have renewable energy, technology, climate kind of pushing us all together, I would argue. And that's very, very different than what it was in 2000. Um, now the EIM, we have to separate from the day ahead market 
and Pacific Core's alleged intent to join the full market as a PTO, as a full market participant. They're, even though they're going in parallel tracks, we have to separate them. So, John, on your question of is there agreement on the EIM, I think we're pretty close on that. The regulators have already started to meet. We've had two or three meetings. We've formed a group, informal. Uh, as, as it may, President Picker, I'd like to commend you, uh, uh, especially Commissioner Florio. I mean, the California commissioners have been extremely um, accommodating to us, both in terms of traveling out of state, which I know you don't have the budget to do. Uh, you're getting cut your budget, which is another issue. I mean, how, how can you accomplish the goals of SB 350 when they're cutting your budget by $5 million, Michael? That's another subject. But anyway, uh, Michael and Mike and the California Commissioner staff have been very accommodating. We've been talking. We've had meetings on the EIM. Um, the Transitional Committee produced an excellent report. Travis, Rebecca, everybody worked really hard on that. And we'll get into a discussion of the issues. But I'd, I'd, I'd say there's, there's growing consensus on the need for an EIM because of the overgeneration in California, because of the RPSs. But there is no consensus yet on the full PTO of Pacific Corps. It's going to require a long, laborious process, six state commissions, and this is not Susan's commission in Arizona. Arizona is a different creature. But at least the six Pacific Corps states are going to have to go through a, a very uh, time-consuming and difficult, challenging regulatory process. So just to frame that distinction that you brought up, uh, in terms of a quick snapshot, Stephanie, if you can just bring that snapshot of the EIM uh, up for us in a second. So this is the EIM basically as it exists today and with some prospective folks to, to join it, um, just so people get a sense of, the, of what the patchwork quilt is beginning to look like, whether or not it ends up, to mix my metaphors again, as a coherent picture on the box top of the puzzle or separate puzzle pieces trying to get together, uh, I think it's probably too soon to say. And conversely, thinking ahead to full participation, what that might look like, the kinds of benefits and the kinds of characteristics that might accrue to people in that mode. Stephanie, if you can just switch that next slide. You know, this is the Pacific Core that you were just talking about uh, and Cal ISO. Uh, this is what that, foot, that particular footprint looks like. Okay, now that leaves me with two other people we haven't heard from. Mr. Berberick, you're the host of this event. How do you see this issue of consensus, cooperation, unified vision? Really, John, I'm not even sure why I'm on this panel. Um, <laughs> we, we, we had an extra seat, and we figured, what the which, heck? So raise, we, can, we can all unite against. Well, that's, that was my sense, and it, it raises more extent, existential issues about it. Uh, ostensibly, I'm in charge of the ISO. You would think I could manage myself off a panel. Um, <laughs> and uh, my, uh, my second working theory is very consistent with President Picker, with just gave somebody somebody to pick on. So um, that's fine, too. But look, I, I think that uh, uh, Commissioner Jones really kind of defined it well. I think we need to talk about this, really. There's an energy imbalance market, then there's potential full participation. But broadly, I know this, as states around us have to comply with 111D or some version of the Clean Power Plan, and California always obviously has its ambitious plans, there are intersections. And we can either do this all on our own and spend a whole lot of money, or we can try to tr do this together and save money, I think. And I also think about just the really principled portfolio effect of renewables. I remember uh, Chair Smith, uh, Bitter Smith, when the Super Bowl was in, uh, in Phoenix last year, and I was watching it one morning, and, and it was dark here, but it was light in Phoenix. So the solar comes up, obviously, earlier in the east in Utah and Arizona and all those areas where California has this large ramp. And we have to fire up gas plants to take care of that ramp. Whereas we could leverage resources out of the state to help with that. And similarly, as Arizona and Nevada have high heat and California is relatively modest, we all know, and we've talked about it this morning, that we may have over-generation, which I think can benefit um, 
the surrounding states, both in their compliance, but also from a lowering of cost perspective. But as we do that, um, I think it's incumbent upon us, and I think it's incumbent upon the ISO and those involved with this to be respectful of the jurisdictions that occur in those states, to be flexible to accommodate those jurisdictions in those states and the special needs of them. And that's the approach that we're taking. So I think we have a great intersection at play here. John, Oregon. Okay, I'm going to tell you why Steve's here. Uh, if not for Cal ISO and not for Pacific Corps, we would not be up here talking about regional coordination. The EIM was dead in the water in 2012. We were leaving money on the table. It is incredibly difficult to get coordination in the West. We, you know, California, I'm sorry, California kind of operates as a, effectively as a nation state. Uh, the rest of the system is balkanized. We've got PMAs, we've got publics, we've got, uh, you know, we've got distrust of markets in California up in Northwest. It is an incredibly hard getting coordination. And it was because of that, to me is, is that, you know, to me is there's no shortage of ideas. What matters more is execution and you need smart, persistent champions like them to execute. Now we have before us something that with an initial benefit of 3.4 to 9.1 billion dollars. How long are we gonna leave that on the table is the issue. So the EIM report that I'm holding in my hand here uh, refers and gives the backdrop to that 3.4 to 9 billion dollar net present value over 20 years. That's the PAC integration report, not EIM. I, I'm the PAC integration report, my, my, my apologies. That's why I'm here. All right, thank you. We, you know, Get your act Every right. panel needs a librarian, can I just say that? I think we have to observe one thing about this, which is that in part, this is all driven in the short term for us by the fact that load serving entities are actually making decisions to do this. I think if, as commissioners, we were designing it, it would certainly look a lot different even if we were agreed and we had direction that we were going to do this on, on our own. But in fact, it's happening and we're all reacting to it. Um, here in California, we did have a policy consensus and direction around the EIM, but in other states, it's mostly because uh, Arizona Public Service or, uh, or uh, um, PGE or Puget Sound actually made the decision. Now we have to react to it and as regulators, we're starting to, to work together to better understand it as an interstate vehicle and to figure out how this kind of a larger beast will actually affect our separate interests. And again, um, there are two commissions where the commissioners are elected publicly. There are three where we're appointed by the governor. That's a different qualitative level of direction to actually see how to make this work. Some people have a different test to measure whether it's actually in the, in the public's benefit. So this is a challenge. For us, the, the, the real level of cooperation that we can approach this as is we can share information as to how we're reacting to it, and we can start to think what are the problems that we may have to deal with if this thing actually sticks together. And I think your point is well taken. That's exactly what has happened, is that in this case, this issue has been driven by uh, our utility providers. They have taken the onus, and in fact, in my state, I don't even have the authority to preclude Arizona Public Service from participating in the EIM. Not that I would want to do that, but, but we are now in a chicken and egg concept where we're having to deal with some things that if the regulator community was starting at the beginning, the issues that we've talked about, the policy, political differences would have been handled first, and then the operational uh, issues secondly. I'm not sure that's actually the best way to do it. The operational decisions may be exactly where they should be at the forefront, forcing us to deal and react and respond and work together so we don't get into the, the water wars that you referenced and I certainly have experienced from Arizona. So is the implication of that that basically your job as regulators is to not get in the way of the commercial transactions that are driving these kinds of changes? Depends upon... I just say that perhaps on behalf of some of you in the audience. I mean, in, in large part, you know, it depends in my new role as a regulator as to whether it's really in the ratepayers' benefits and whether the, it serves the system and therefore serves the, the benefit of the ratepayers. You know, we have a plan due to US EPA 
that says how we're going to meet some fairly aggressive targets for carbon reduction in the electric utility sector in each one of our states. And every state has to look at their own system. Uh, they also have to look at their neighbors and see whether there's a better way to do business. And I think the first uh, step in that is to recognize that all of this is regulatory. It's not, uh, it, it is not the Wild West in the sense that there are no rules, but designing those rules is being very much uh, pushed by the utility sector. That's, that's who we're hearing from. I think, John, um, the job of a regulator is not to be a legislator, so we do not go out and set policy. Travis is elected, I'm appointed, there could be a difference between us, as Michael said, but our job is to call balls, balls and strikes, to regulate rates, terms and conditions of affordable electric service in the public interest, but there is a difference when how proactive you want to be beyond being reactive. There are many commissions, commissioners that want to be more reactive. There, there are some who want to be more proactive. I think what John was saying is absolutely, absolutely right. In CREPSI and in the Western Interconnection, we've been talking about an EIM for what? Uh, six years? Five years. And as John said, it was dead in the water. I mean, Jason Marks of New Mexico did great work. Travis has done great work. But until you get a critical mass of utilities and transmission owners saying, let's go do it, for these reasons, it probably ain't going to happen. And that's what's happened. So we are more reactive than proactive, although with, within CREPSI and other policy-making forums, and as Mary said, 111D is forcing us to do a lot of things that we probably didn't contemplate five years ago. So it's kind of a balance between proactive and reactive. Joe, well, can I make an observation? Pacific Corps is going to have to, if they bring forth a proposal, they're going to have to make a case, they're going to have to show, make their case that the benefits exceed the cost for customers. Our client here is the customers. Uh, and we're going to do, and they can attest, at least in Oregon, our review is very rigorous. We're going to make, we're going to make sure that we believe every cost number that they give us, we're going to, and then we believe every benefit number, and that we look at the expected risks. That part of the cost calculus is the expected risks of, of a proposition like this. But once we're there, if they make their case, it's good to go. And I would just add, John, that, that as an elected commissioner, um, and remember in Arizona, most commissioners are going to be of the majority party, which happens to be Republican. So understand that typically you would not have elected commissioners who are attempting to stop pro-business opportunities. But the reality is in this particular instance, this is one that was that's interesting because there is not a great political push from Arizona residents to do anything that would tie them to California. No offense, that's just not, that, that's not a good campaign speech for me. So this, in this case, with APS taking the, the forward thrust, it forces us, in a sense, to be responsive, which is not the normal role for an elected commissioner in Arizona. In this case, though, I think it was a great step for us to be more broad-minded, to have the conversations that clearly we need to have because there's been a demonstrated need and a benefit for our ratepayers. That's the important element. As John says, at the end of the day, that's what my job is, is to benefit ratepayers and make sure we have good, solid operating utilities. So, so okay. given the reality of caliphobia, uh, if you will, uh, what are the implications of that in terms of the kind of governance principles? And I use governance with a small g for now because I'm not presuming that there's any particular kind of entity, whether it's an EIM or what have you, but what are the first principles that each of you would see as a way to accommodate the variety of your state interests, the difference of your constitutional, statutory, and elected authority on the one hand, but under this broad tent of either whether you're forced into it because of 111D or because you're voluntarily entering into it because of GHG uh, concerns and the like. What are the first principles that you think ought to be in mind here as you move towards a greater degree of regional collaboration? And I use that term advisedly too. What are some of your thoughts on that? I, I think the first things we have to look at are we need some sort of more regional governance approach. And that gets to basically through the region involvement in the selection of the board. Now the board has to be an independent board. It has to be of the, the caliber of the current board. Uh, you know, it, but it has to be seen as something with a regional perspective. And that entity also has to be prepared to deal with, on the one hand, there are federal requirements at FERC 
I mean, this is ultimately it will be a FERC regulated entity that it's got to comply with, but it also has to deal with complying with the legislative and policy directions of each state, which are, which are going to be different, but at the end of the day, this entity has to comply with both the federal and state and the different st state regulations uh, oh. and not make people feel like somehow California law is going to reign throughout the West. It's got to respect the differences of the various regions. How do the rest of you see this? What, what are the principles here? Well, I think the first know? principle is this has got to pass muster with six other states. And is that, does that end up being, in effect, a lowest common denominator? That's standard? going to be the most common denominator because everybody's got a veto. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, we, I can talk high level principles, but I'm going to tell you that it ultimately it's going to come down to all six states and California are going to find, have to find it acceptable. So I don't know what that is. Just I hope we find it. Phil? And, and I think, John, we need to break it down to, in, into EIM board and if PAC is successful, let's take 2018, they join as a PTO, a revised board. You have to break it down, too. I, I think we'll get some good experience with governance with the EIM board, with this new governance body that the transition committee kind of outlined. It's going to be a five-member body. So you'll have five on the EIM, five on the CAISO board. But strict numbers are eight states, five per state, a 40-member board. I mean, that's not workable. That's a whole, that's a whole yeah, other noun, no. a, a, a body looking for a noun. But if you read section... Conflagration <laughs> comes to mind, but I'm not quite sure about that. But the people in this audience know California statutes better than I do, but I read it before this meeting. I think it's section 339 or 7 says... It's, it's pretty clear. The board of the ISO shall be, shall be appointed by the governor of California, subject to confirmation by the Senate. That's not going to work in Arizona. That's not going to work in my state or Oregon. So, so if we, the EIM board is going to be different. You know, it's going to be, we're all, we're, we're, we're going to submit, the regulators are going to submit, submit somebody to serve on the nominating committee. And hopefully in the first or second quarter of 2016, the EIM board will start working and then have to deal with the CAISO board, the CAISO staff. But ultimately, if you're talking about the end game here, there has to be, I think as John said, a much bigger conversation. It has to pass muster with six other governors or seven, legislators, commissions, state energy offices, anybody involved in state energy policy in the neighboring BAs and adjacent states. It's going to have to pass, pass muster. Travis, what are we missing in terms of guidelines here? No, for I, I, I think what's been said is, is really accurate, and how Phil described it is, is how the EIM Transitional Committee, uh, which included Bob and Rebecca Wagner and myself, uh, set it up. I mean, there, there will be a, a sort of a parallel five member EIM governing body, and it gets to make the decisions first on matters affecting EIM tariff rules before they proceed to the California ISO's Board of Governors. You know, you, you can try to anticipate a, 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 as much as you can um, all the gaming and loopholes and things to try, to try to figure out how a malevolent actor or someone who would be self-seeking on the part of a particular state could try to break a governance framework. But fundamentally, what I hope comes out of EIM, other than the, the visible benefits of its operation, is as a kind of training wheels institution, uh, a development of trust which will hopefully be fostered through the work of the body of state regulators, through the relationship of this independent EIM board with the ISO Board of Governors. Uh, you know, fundamentally, a lot of the conversations I've had, we've, we've produced in the, con in the scope of the work of CREPC, which, which John leads in the PUC EIM group, and E3's work with all of the benefits studies that have been produced for EIM entities, we have a bevy of studies that show there are operational efficiencies on the table. And that's what led regulators to be interested in this in the first place, that you kept seeing production cost model results that showed you how the West was supposed to operate if transmission assets were utilized to their full engineering capacity, and yet that's not how the West operated. We continually uh, performed with a higher overall system cost than in the so-called efficient case. And so, but, but whenever you delivered those results to certain parties throughout the West, it would be a debate between the quantitative results of these models and the objection to it would say, would be fundamentally qualitative. 
that I won't get in bed with California. Well, you can't have an argument like that where one person's presenting numbers and the other person is replying with not numbers. And so the only way to break through the only way to break through that is by doing something that is mundane and frankly unsexy like a real-time energy market which is what the EIM is and and proving trust through that before you do something like a full-blown ISO that implicates things like long-term transmission build out of actual hardware as opposed to simply optimizing the software which again all of us are already paying for uh, anyways. Well, you could throw organic tomatoes at one another. There's another option here. You could Mary. Do that. Mary. Well, I don't know what the governance structure uh, ends up looking like, and I can imagine a number of different ways you could put it together, but uh, it seems to me that this is a case, and I think maybe this is just saying what Travis said in a slightly different way, that um, the form needs to follow function, and the function is uh, something that everybody needs to agree is in their interest. To, it's to their benefit as an individual state. And from there, you can move to what the governance board needs to look like. Now, from California's perspective, I assume that we continue to be buyers of electricity from other places, uh, but also that we would like to be able to be sellers. I also assume that we uh, are going to have in the regulatory scheme excess uh, emissions reductions in the sense that we've moved further faster than some others have done in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because we made a decision as a state to do that. Uh, so our ratepayers have already invested in that. Our public has already invested in that and we don't want to have to uh, just give those to everybody else because we want to be friends. But at the same time, we recognize that California always ends up as the biggest player here, uh, to some degree, ending up having to pay more than others do. And that's a reality that I think is already um, well absorbed and well understood uh, by, by our decision makers here. So if we were having this conversation 10 years from now, what fundamentally will have changed in terms of both how the grid is organized, who runs it, what it's doing? What's, is there a fundamental change here or is this all an incremental progress towards something that 10 years from now is gonna look more or less like what it is now? Okay, I'm gonna give you a forecast. Uh, four years this will be up and operating. In five years, other utilities will wanna join. Seven years from now, we'll say, Jesus, this was a no-brainer. And then in 10 years from now, overlaying all of this, the one thing I, I can't get to is going to be sort of how the distribution system and the transmission system are going to start melding together. And I think there's going to be very uh, sort of gigantic, California's dealing with it now, Hawaii's de dealing with it now. I think the rest of the states eventually will be dealing with it, and I think that's going to be the biggest factor now that I cannot predict in 10 years. Bob, what's your 10-year sense? Well, again, I, I tend to think that the renewable costs are going down enough that's going to drive the resource mix, combine that with the clean power plan, and at the same time, the technology options are expanding. You know, if you think about, you know, we really should be talking about what ISO 3.0 looks like in terms of given the computer capability you're going to have, you know. And, and the sensing te technology we're going to have and the energy you know, demand of sport, you know, there's just, uh, you know, incredible opportunities just over the horizon that we can get to if we can use that enabling technology and come up with the grid of the future that really is based much more around renewables and, and load modification. Well, that sounds much more transformational in one sense than simply expansion of what we have now. Steve, how do you see that? Well, I was going to say, I was going to remind everyone that in the governor's state of the state, what he basically said was that to deal with the climate challenges, we have to transform, you know, our communities, our grid, you know, and, and our cities, and our buildings. Everything has to be transformed. And I guess part of the message is that that also has to occur to our institutions and that the ISO is the first institution going through that sort of transformation to address the challenges and opportunities of the future. Can I make one observation before I turn sure. over, but it was uh, following up, is I think that if we go to a regional ISO that will actually advance new technologies faster than otherwise. 
I think I'm, we I'm will speed it up I'm going to use the rules in this region. I'm going to use the rules of the presidential debates. Mr. Berbrick, your name was mentioned. You have an opportunity to respond. How, how long do I have? <laughs> no, I, I think this discussion uh, is meritorious and really gets really at the heart of it, which we know we now have the energy imbalance market, um, and it's working. Um, it's producing transparent prices, and we're, we're saving money. We know a five-minute dispatch is an optimization is inherently more efficient than doing it on an hourly basis. Throw renewables into that mix, which we're all going to have to do as you go to 111D, and it really becomes important. So that's critical. The other element then gets to, all right, so EIM, it works. We'll work out the governance of it. I think that'll continue on its own path. The integration, though, of PAC with the ISO is going to raise the bar. Because whereas the five minute market allows you a certain amount of benefits, the five minute market is just froth. The real benefits are in a day ahead market where you can make commitment decisions, which will help you with 111D, but it'll also reduce your costs. Because we know, for instance, much of the benefit out of the PAC ISO integration is that we don't have the same our capacity in the ISO plus PACS capacity combining them is less than we have to have separately and that's billions of dollars and that's ratepayer money but it's also emissions so I see it as John does I think the economics the imperatives of the climate and all of those things will continue to drive this what will be incumbent upon the ISO is to continue to move the ball forward on, on governance, as we all talked about here, we full well know and that this won't happen if the ISO's governance doesn't change. We know that it's not acceptable in Oregon or Arizona or Montana or Washington to have a California govern uh, uh, dominated governance. So it's a non-starter if that doesn't change, and we know that. So that has to be top of mind. EIM will continue to run with it. We will create as an independent board as we can, and I think we have, and Travis, hats off to you and Rebecca for the work that you've done to do that. I think EIM will continue to prove the value proposition, and I see it unfolding just as John Savage does, which is you can't ignore the money on the table. You can't ignore the climate opportunities as you're trying to comply with these, whether you want to voluntarily comply, whereas California wants to press the ball, or you have to. Um, I think those are the imperatives that we're going to be up against. The ISO, though, has to evolve, both technically but also from a governance perspective and from a customer service perspective, so that we are respectful and accommodative of those other states, their jurisdiction over procurement, their jurisdiction over policy. And I full well think that we can accommodate those things as we move forward. Michael, what are the uh, ripple effects of this potential move to an ISO 3.0 moving in the direction that Steve laid out vis-a-vis -vis the PUC in California? I, um, again, the, the, the by inherent, the inherent role of, of, of regulators is to avoid risk <clears throat> and to maximize benefits. And so we're going to have to balance that. I think that people have described the opportunities, uh, a uh, more efficient uh, uh, grid in the West with uh, less uh, waste and cost, uh, technology innovation, money on, on, the, on the table. So I, I, I think that, that they, all, they are all there. The challenge will be at some point we have to come to, to grips with all those things that we want to avoid and that we fear. And everybody has a different list of things that are inherent in their state political culture that will come up that we have to avoid. And we can do what people always do. You know, if the benefits are great enough, you get in a room and you figure out how to avoid those things that you fear. And at, at, the, at, the, out, at the end, you actually start moving on it and, and you've got a structure that you can use to make adjustments. So um, I, I, I think that it will force us to actually become a little bit more ecumenical and regional in our thinking. I don't usually think too far beyond the California borders. 
Um, and it's, it, you know, when I do, it, I, I, it's always been Nevada because we have a stronger economic connection because of uh, the, the, pub, the goods movement industry. Um, so we're, we're having to actually start to rethink the way we look at these things. I, I will say that I have a firm expectation that probably at the end of 10 years it, the world looks a lot like what John describes, except that we'll all wear sandals and hoodies as business wear. I, I, was, I was struck when I, when I saw the $3.4 billion, $9 billion range over 20 years in terms of net present value. Uh, I just had a chance to look it up. The nine billion, if you assume the high end of that in terms of an NPV, is about equal to the state budget uh, of, of either Nevada or Montana today. So these are big numbers, obviously. <laughs> Susan, you were trying to get in earlier. Well, I simply wanted to reiterate what you've just heard from from Steve and and Michael and others that this is this is going to be a new world. The, the encouragement and understanding that this has to be a more ecumenical approach, the conversations that are happening as a model EIM are very positive for the state that just talked about calophobia. Um, I think we're getting all the right signals. Now, we don't have a stake yet, yet in, in ISO governance, but we certainly do in EIM. And everything we're hearing is oriented towards the right direction. The, the commentary from the full commission in California, from ISO leadership, from the conversations that have happened in a very short span of time in Arizona, have certainly given us all the right indications that we too have to stop saying, well, when we get to the Colorado River after we fight about it, um, that we need to be understanding of how we can work together despite our political and philosophical differences. And I, that's happening in my state, it's happening in California, happening other, and so, the, all the signals are very, very positive, in my opinion, to get to that viewpoint that John described from 10 years now, and also deal with the governance challenges and political challenges that certainly will come along the way. So are there major roadblocks in the way that we haven't talked about? We've talked about the jurisdictional identity, we've talked about the traditions sometimes, the positives and negatives of prior relationships among, among your states. Are there other fundamental obstacles or roadblocks between where we are today and where you see this evolving over the course of the next 10 years. Let me just Steve? say, John, a couple comments. I don't know that they're fundamental roadblocks, but they're definitely things that have to be sorted out. Um, the transmission access charge. Uh, those in California want to make sure that the, they don't get cost allocations from other states. Other states want to make sure they don't get cost allocations from California. So how we finesse that transmission access charge, as an example, is a, is a fundamental issue we'll have to sort out. Resource adequacy issues, making sure that the balancing authorities aren't leaning on one another, states aren't leaning on one another, we'll have to sort through that. But I think, um, just like we've solved any, all, m most of the issues that have confronted us so far, I think we'll come to terms with this too. What we'll have to come to terms with, though, from a California perspective, as an example, if we build a line in, in, in uh, Utah that maybe is economic to bring power or policy um, uh, uh, energy into California, that might be a good thing. And that might need to be allocated to California. Similarly, exports out of California, perhaps, into Nevada. And so we'll have to sort through those things, but uh, we're going to start and I'm certain that we'll have good solutions to it. We will do it transparently, and we'll make sure that we attend to each jurisdiction's needs. Phil? Just to list a few challenges, and these are just in the non-opportunities. We've been talking a lot about benefits. Uh, you have something called Bonneville in the Northwest, the Bonneville Power Administration. It is not going to, under its statutory rules and our congressional delegation, there is no way that it is ever going to join the CAISO. But there are significant operational efficiencies that can be wrung out of the system. And I know Steve and Elliot Mainzer and others are talking frequently, but that is a issue that could create seams issues. If you look at PGM and MISO and the other RTOs, there's a lot of conflict about seams issues. And so, seams issues are going to get in the way here a bit. Not, not only at COI, uh, the California-Oregon border, but at Nevada and, and Arizona. The other thing is FERC, FERC jurisdiction. So a lot of my utilities, the, the PUDs and the munis, and I represent all of them as a, 
as, a, as an appointed energy regulator in the state of Washington, but 55% of my power is delivered by munis, co-ops, PUDs. They do not want FERC jurisdiction. They want things to be uh, regional, uh, maybe work out things with California, but we have a tradition in the Northwest of working things out regionally. They've tried to develop a SCED, Security Constrained Economic Dispatch, uh, through something called the MC Initiative, they have not been successful. But the game ain't over yet. So that could be a, a, a challenge. The other challenge is to our friends in the Rocky Mountain states. As we saw in the graph today from Michael, there's still going to be a significant amount of, of thermal generation, both coal and natural gas. You asked about 10 years. This will go to 2030 or 40. So you're going to have a lot of thermal generation in the system. You're going to have different policies on coal and on the use of natural gas. The Sierra Club has a campaign now against the use of beyond gas. I mean, if they want to take natural gas out, out of our system in the West, that's going to be a big challenge. I mean, coal maybe, but natural gas, as many of you know, is being used for ramping up and down and helping to balance winds. So those are a few challenges that we haven't talked about yet. Bob, you painted the uh, picture of profound technological innovation on all kinds of different levels. Oftentimes in other industries that translates into lower costs, not just and, and additional efficiency. What do you think the ultimate cost and rate impact of this move to regionalization is likely to have? Well, I think again you have to set up the counterfactual. Either we try to do everything in our own little balancing authorities with all the reserves and all the reserve requirements with renewables, as Travis said, with intermittent, or we you know, look at those opportunities. And, we, and in fact, every single entity, every balancing authority can go through the experience the Cal ISO went through in terms of developing the software. And you know, the cost difference is enormous uh, between that. And so particularly, I think the technology is there to really empower people going forward, but again, it's just when you, you know, when you look at the basic dynamic with renewables, it's very important to get to shorter and shorter dispatch periods, or else you're going to have larger and larger reserves. And similarly, it's very important to sort of look more regional, or else again, you're going to have larger and larger reserves in every single balancing authority to back that up. And, you know, just the complexity of dealing with you know, the opportunities now, you know, as I said, the technology at this point is really phenomenal, but there are challenges. I mean, that also means on the cybersecurity front, every single balancing authority is going to have to have a really lock solid arrangement. And so certainly the level of expertise that we're talking about to really harvest the opportunities of renewables, it, I think is going to, to really challenge many of the smaller entities in the West well, we're offering an opportunity to really move forward now, particularly at least on the energy and balance market. I think the ISO is sort of giving people an offer that's hard to refuse unless you're very California-phobic and very FERC-phobic. And certainly there are bigger steps for PAC. But again, I think that the imperatives of the change in the industry really force this type of consolidation. And we question challenge for us is to do it thoughtfully particularly in terms of the governance issues. I tend to agree that I think the EIM, I believe, under Rebecca's leadership, we came up with a fairly good solution there. Uh, the more, you know, more challenging is going to be the you know, these overall ultimate governance issues. Travis and then Steve. Yeah, so let, let me just identify maybe in, by analogy what an ISO really is, because I wouldn't want us to think that the ISO in and of itself is the transformational element here. Really, it, it is much more mundane than that. It is an IT platform that optimizes through its software the hardware that's already in the ground. It is the NASDAQ that replaces something that looks a lot more like Craigslist right now. Right. Um, it, it is also uh, a, a tariff, a regulatory instrument that facilitates new build of certain types of hardware, like transmission, which is built in response to identified needs of load-serving entities, to accomplish public policy requirements, and the kind of base case of the benefits that optimization of overlaying that IT platform can deliver for you are things like 
non-California entities being in a position to be absorptive of over-generation of renewables by California. Other uh, outside of California parties have a lot of idling uh, natural gas capacity during certain hours of the year that can be dispatched into California uh, in, in preference of assets that would, have been, would be more high cost for all of you to run. But there's also the, the potential, at least, for more significant benefits that uh, an ISO paves the way for as a matter of political economy. And the benefits report does a good job that E3 has put out uh, of summarizing those. And, and a lot of those do come from the longer term renewable energy procurements and capacity avoidance um, that the ISO accomplishes through transmission build out and the deferral and the, and the co coinciding of different entities' peaks, which, as Steve points out, are, are lesser together than individually, the sum of them. But all of those decisions ultimately tie back to something that will still be in the hands of state politicians, and that's long-term resource decision-making. Um, the, the ISO, through its implementation, offers state regulators a chance to make less costly more efficient procurement decisions, but it doesn't force them to do that. And, and there will be a healthy debate. I, we've talked a lot about what outside of California states think about California, but there needs to be some soul searching on the part of California itself too. I mean, th there's this healthy debate going on across the nation about why do we have things like a renewable portfolio standard? Is it to decarbonize or is it really a jobs program? Is it a program to advantage certain technologies, to allow them to break through? Um, what, what exactly is the purpose of an RPS? I kind of go with the assumption underlying it all that it's to decarbonize and to do something about the threat of global, global climate change. That it's not just a log rolling opportunity for people to seek rents from state legislatures, although it often looks a lot like that. So let's hear, let's, let's hear from Steve on this one. Sure. Well, uh, Travis actually uh, channeled me quite well. The, well. the thing I wanted to try to get to, Which but part, I think the Craigslist part or the other part? <laughs> you pick and choose. Um, Would you like to continue my rant, Steve? Uh, I will, yes. I'll see if I can do my Travis, yeah, no, Travis. Um, the thing I wanted, I, I think Travis really boiled down the right thing. Really what we offer is a technology platform. It's a five minute security constraint optimization. And, the thing I want to make sure everybody understands is we spent $200 million on that. The, the cost of entry is really, really high to create these things. Texas spent $600 million on this. So this technology platform, which the scale that the ISO has can continue to evolve that technology platform um, I think is an important thing that we can offer, but in fundamentally, we're offering our technology. The rest is, is governance and, and tariff and politics, but uh, fundamentally it's technology. So, Mary, we haven't heard from you lately. I was enjoying <laughs> listening, actually. <laughs> What's, what, what lessons have you picked up through your experience with the Air Resources Board here that we haven't talked about that might help facilitate, create the, the, the WD-40. I mean, WD-40, you know, didn't start out as WD-40. There was WD-1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to WD-39. <laughs> finally, they got it right. The Rocket Chemical Company finally got it right in 1953. You've been down this path, right? Uh, far longer than many others. What, what other advice Thanks do you have from your John. experience? <laughs> Well, I, I was thinking about um, the negotiations that led to the successful adoption of California's uh, cap and trade program for greenhouse gases, which does serve as at least one of the uh, inputs to the discussions that people are having here, where we were able to bridge the divide between Northern California, IOU, regulated by the Public Utilities Commission with a very high degree of um, renewable electricity coming from hydro, and Southern California publicly owned utility with a lot of coal that's the biggest emitter in the state. And the two of them were able to come together as a result of some very 
skillful negotiations and some real leadership on the part of uh, some of the utility uh, sector uh, folks in uh, agreeing on a, a scheme which in the end um, allowed everybody to start where they are and get to the same point and along the way uh, recognize the differences in the way that they are governed very explicitly with the IOUs having to go through the Public Utilities Commission to um, rule on how they could use their allowances and uh, LADWP and Anaheim and Burbank each with their own separately elected boards um, retaining the control over their own allowances. I was thinking about the, the word um, ecumenical, which both uh, Susan and, and Michael used in that context, because I don't think you could get more religiously diverse than IOUs and POUs um, historically, and, um, and yet uh, ultimately at the end of the day, they did recognize that the state was going to go ahead with some kind of a program. They needed to come up with something that was going to work and that they could do it in a way where um, I think it's fair to say that the IOUs were a little more generous to their colleagues than they might have just automatically been, but they needed them in the system. And the POUs recognized that they were going to have to play and they couldn't just walk away. And so they did come together and, and all uh, support uh, the, the rule itself and are now living with it uh, quite successfully. So um, I, I do think that we have experience that shows that in a situation which is maybe not quite as geographically diverse, but in many respects does mirror some of the differences in resource mix and politics uh, that you see uh, represented up here on the stage, um, that when people decide that they uh, are better off, as you said at the beginning, uh, working together, um, that, that they can find a way to do it. You know, there was one term that uh, we did not talk about in the first panel, and I'm curious about what the view of this panel is on the issue of curtailment. Um, what's, is there a connection here between curtailment as an effective strategy and the push to greater regional collaboration? Those two things best left separate? What's your sense of that? John? We'll take all the negatively priced energy you can give us. You know, negative, negative pricing, <laughs> negative it's pricing, I love, cost. That. I, I love that term, negative pricing. Is that, you mean a bribe? I'm just curious. <laughs> Steve, how do you see this? It's curtailment. Well, I, I, let me play off of what, what John said, because um, fundamentally, I, I agree with him. And, and as a regulator in, in a surrounding state, uh, why wouldn't you want to have all the cheap energy you could possibly get? Um, as it relates to California, and what I, I'll channel the IOU senior leadership, they would say, well, hang on a second. We're paying for all this capacity. And I would say to them, well, it's better to sell it for something than nothing. And I also know from my economics classes in college, if we can create a market under it, then there may be price support so that instead of selling it for negative 10, maybe we get positive 10, which is still good for California, but also still good for Oregon. So um, this exchange of energy, I think, is a win-win proposition for both of us. If we operate here in California as an island and just curtail all this electricity, it doesn't make any societal, economic, or political sense. It just doesn't. It's wasted. And the kind of energy we're talking about, by 2024, as many of you probably heard me say, we expect to have 13,500 megawatts of overgeneration in certain periods of the year and throughout the year. That's a lot of power. That's more than a lot of the neighboring balancing authorities use. Um, and if it's not negative, it's just going to be curtailed. And I don't think that's the right answer. So um, I think there are win-win models as we exchange. You know, there, there are different models, obviously, of regional interaction. Uh, border patrols, walls, alliances, mergers, et cetera. Let me give each of you a final shot at how you think this regional picture on the box top might look? What, do you, what would you like to see over the course of the next five to 10 years? Michael, let's start with you, can we? 
I don't think we actually can conceive of all the opportunities. So I'm just going to say that what I hope we start to do is all begin to live in the world that Travis does and less in the world that, that I do where, where it, things are, are governed more by ma maximizing the opportunities rather than avoiding the risks. And so I think that if we can figure out w how we, we um, um, actually make that cognitive um, shift uh, together, uh, which may actually then require us to actually focus a little bit on exactly what it is that we fear, what it actually is that we must avoid, so that we can actually put more of our energy and attention to, to maximizing the benefits. I think that, that, that that's as, as, as good as I can hope for in, in this kind of a, a political exchange. I will say that we are not at the state that we are in terms of water policy. We're in a much better place where I think we do talk to each other, we do see the benefits, and we actually have been able to overcome some of the, the concerns about risk and to protect ourselves. And I think we're looking at further opportunities to do that. But it's, it's not an easy thing to conceive of that. It's easier to either paint a picture of complete ruin or, comp or complete heaven. Phil. As I said before, I think the EIM is a great start. Travis uh, used the same words as I did, training wheels. So we, so we give it a go on this co-optimization and trying to relieve some of the inefficiencies of the current system. So that, that'll be maybe two or three years. But at the same time, PAC will probably join or intends to join the full ISO. Uh, if that happens, that will be in about three to four years. By that time, we will have a new governance structure. If the thing is going to happen, we're going to have a revised governance structure. I would see more collaboration with the governor's offices. I think Governor Brown's office has reached out to the six governor's energy policy advisors, so that dialogue has begun, which is good. Mary's in the room. We're going to have to get our air quality regulators in the room. It's, it's going to be a bigger discussion, but I would see a revamp board that's probably larger than five members. I would see at least uh, four, five, six members appointed by governors or through some body from other from the surrounding states. I, I hope to see some benefits. We realize that you've invested a lot of money in MRTU and the platform, but if you could have a presence in a state like Utah or Oregon that already has a lot of energy infrastructure where the ISO could, could set up something like that, it would have visibility there, that might help. Um, what else? We got uh, 111D regulations. We, we have those coming down the pike. Uh, we're probably going to need some new transmission capacity. So that means we're going to have to get our siting authorities involved. If California really goes, this is my personal opinion, if California really goes to 50% RE, you're going to have to bring in more wind and solar from other areas than just within your state. So that would mean building a new transmission line takes about 10 years, 8 to 10 years. You know, it's, it's, it's laborious, but I think we're going to need more transmission too. Bob. Well, I, I think fundamentally, again, looking out at, at the issues here, uh, you know, as Travis said, the first thing is it's an IT package, and really we're looking at that opportunity for folks. So in terms of sort of demonstrating the case on that uh, through EIM and, go and going forward, I think the technology is really going to drive us. I think it reminds me a lot of project financing deals, where the first thing is everyone in the room would have to decide, is this project really uh, beneficial? And once you decided that, then the whole putting together the ultimate project finance was you decided what was the allocation of benefits, what was the allocation of risk, and how did you mitigate those risks and come up with a, a package that basically worked for everyone. And that's the challenge for us, although I would, would certainly discourage, you know, from any sort of conception that where we want to end up with the board, which is sort of us, you know, we had the original ISO board is more, much larger, it was a stakeholder board, it represented specific interest, and it was a disaster. So I think, again, we have to be looking at something that's more, here's the independent board, which is really reflecting the regional needs, but not necessarily here's the little hat on everyone, which piece they came from. There, there, there's a good first principle there, disaster avoidance, I get that. Mary? I think we should design the logo first. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, you've got a candidate around a duck, but I don't think that probably works <laughs> work very well. <laughs> Travis. Yeah, I, I, I think what Rebecca led with, you know, the, from Ben Franklin, better all hang together or we'll hang apart, is a pretty cautionary lesson in the times we're facing here. You know, you've heard a bit about the role of, of state utility commissioners, but they also began uh, as a substitute for competition. That's why we're here. The idea that the incumbent monopolies that at one point in time dominated the electric industry uh, were not necessarily prone to seeking out efficiencies, and that we were responsible for making sure that ratepayer dollars that were spent on infrastructure resulted in infrastructure that was fully utilized to its greatest and most efficient degree. Uh, that's, what, that's the principle upon which we have to keep our eyes. John, you were the most specific in your predictions earlier. Anything to add? Well, three things. Um, one, I, I think big, fast, more integrated Western marketplace has many good attributes, particularly as you add more wind and solar to the system, which we're going to do. Uh, second, I have faith that we're going to work through all the issues that Steve laid out in terms of transmission access charge, transmission planning, resource development. I have great faith. Mo the model I see it after that is that the utilities will accrete. This is kind of like how planetary planets were created, is that they'll add, we'll, add planet, we'll add utilities. As opposed to sedimentary rocks. Yes, right. So we'll add utilities systematically over time, just pretty much as we're doing with the EIM. Steve. Make this observation, John. I think the fact that we have this diverse set of regulators sitting here talking about things, and I think there's a heck of a lot more agreement than there is disagreement. Um, I think that we all agree there's a lot of intersections. I, frankly, um, I couldn't have envisioned this a few years ago. So I think we're moving fast and making some pretty good progress. And just the fact that we're all sitting here together and no one has thrown anything. Uh, I'm particularly appreciative that no one sent anything my way, um, I think is, is a very positive. I haven't even had to wear this yet. Susan, you have the final word. I'd like to echo what, what Michael suggested is the one thing we don't want to have happen is what's happened with water policy where we're still litigating water compacts from 1936 uh, and never making progress there. And the driver here, the difference here, I think, is exactly what you've heard from everybody else on, on the platform. This is about making sure that we have ratepayers taken care of and dollars drive good decisions. And I think that's, that's an impetus for all of us being here today. And secondarily, it's different. We do have competitive resource opportunities. And those two elements, I think, will make sure that regulators don't get in the way. Either they're elected or appointed, still they don't get in the way. And I, I, I'm optimistic that I think this conversation can continue and be positive. And again, as Steve just said, example, we're sitting here together and we actually all like each other and talk to each other on a regular basis is a start in the right, the right direction. How about a round of applause for the rodeo of regulators? <laughs> <laughs>